thank you to the NIH Intramural Research Program for sponsoring today's webinar. Now I'd like to give the floor to our first speaker, and that is Dr. Sriram Subramaniam, who is Chief of the Biophysics Section in the Laboratory of Cell Biology at the Center for Cancer Research at NCI. He will talk about the development of advanced technologies for imaging macromolecular assemblies in three dimension, uh, using, sorry, using three-dimensional electron microscopy and their application to address fundamental problems in AIDS and, uh, and cancer research. Welcome, Dr. Subramaniam. Thank you very much, Sean, and thank you to AAAS. Uh, I'd like to begin by, uh, <coughs> by talking about some of the work we've been doing in the lab over the last few years and to uh, begin by pointing out the spectrum of sizes of interest in biology lined up with some of the technologies used to study these objects. X-ray and NMR methods have been very powerful at the twin ends of the size spectrum uh, in imaging molecules all the way to imaging macroscopic entities, while light and electron microscopy have been very powerful to look at the, some of the objects in the middle, such as cells and tissues. Uh, the point of this slide is uh, that there are nevertheless important gaps in imaging, and those of particular interest to us are the, those that are centered roughly on the size scale of viruses, small subcellular organelles, bacteria, which are typically too heterogeneous or too large to be analyzed using X-ray crystallographic methods or NMR spectroscopic methods, and also uh, difficult to get at using uh, conventional electron or light microscopic methods to get the kind of chemical uh, details about how these molecular assemblies work. In today's talk, I'd like to describe several examples of our work in this gap and touch on examples where we are imaging uh, dynamic protein complexes after they've been isolated from the cell at relatively high resolution, ap approaching one nanometer and sometimes better, uh, to looking at protein assemblies in the context of intact viruses and intact cells, uh, typically membrane proteins, and finally touch on examples where we are developing methods to look at the ultrastructure of very large entities such as mammalian cells and even tissues where we are learning new things about the way in which organelles are organized within cells or how the cell surfaces of these cells mediate cell cell interactions. Uh, in this slide, I show you an image uh, recorded using an electron microscope of a plunge frozen sample of purified Groyle complexes. And each of these individual molecular images is a projection view of the molecule and differs from the others solely with respect to its orientation relative, relative to the electron beam. Because these are recorded at low dose to minimize damage, they're very noisy, but by figuring out the relative orientations of each of these molecules with respect to the others, we can average the information in tens of thousands of these molecules to obtain a density map uh, in this instance of Groyel, uh, which can be at relatively high resolution. Here I show you a map done in our laboratory recently of a density map at about seven axon resolution of Groyel. You can see some of these structures from the helices. Uh, but importantly, uh, we can go beyond merely getting the structures of these complexes to actually learning a little bit about the dynamics of these, uh, these protein assemblies by comparing this with the known structure from X-ray crystallography of the same complex. And if you look at the uh, images on the left, you'll see that while the agreement is very good in the middle of the protein complex, as you go towards the periphery, uh, there are distinct differences in the arrangement of the helices in the protein. So this is an example where using isolated protein assemblies and carrying out cryo-electron microscopy, we can actually not just learn about structures of the proteins, but also learn something about how uh, these proteins, uh, the structure of these proteins in solution may be different from that in an order three-dimensional lattice. Uh, imaging protein assemblies when they're still present in the context of a virus or a cell is a more challenging entity. And here we use a technology called cryo-electron tomography which is uniquely suited to looking at objects that are one of a kind. The principle of imaging here is very similar to that used in computerized axial tomography. And the way we get the 3D information is to record a series of images of the same object over a wide range of angles by varying its orientation with respect to the incident electron beam. And computationally combining these images, we can then obtain a tomogram, which literally is a way to walk into the specimens of interest. Uh, its application to HIV is uh, shown in, the, in this movie, where you can see uh, essentially follow some of the practical steps in going from a suspension of viruses to a plunge frozen specimen, uh, which is vitrified. And you can visualize some of the steps in actually recording images where we show 
the principle of collecting a series of images of the same region by varying the orientation of the electron microscopic grid and eventually combining these to make a tomogram which uh, then gives us a representation of this, of this object, in this case a suspension of viruses in 3D. The challenge here is to take images like these, which is the unit of information that comes out in tomography, and to combine the information present in each one of the red blobs that you see, which represents the uh, structure of a single, envelope, single HIV envelope glycoprotein, and by averaging thousands of these images, we can then obtain density maps which are at resolutions in the 2 to 3 nanometer range. In this case, it's about 2 nanometers. And these contain a lot of information when you combine them with the X-ray crystallographically determined structures of, uh, of pieces of the protein. Here, I show a couple of examples where we've combined the density map derived by cryo-electron tomography with structures of uh, GP120 in complex with antibodies and other ligands uh, derived by X-ray crystallography. And uh, this type of approach uh, gives us a unique opportunity to determine the structures of membrane proteins uh, when they're still present on the surface of an infectious virus. And uh, is, uh, is, is important to uh, understand uh, the design principles that might take us towards a vaccine. Uh, one of the other points I'd like to highlight is uh, it's not just structures that we get out of this, but by piecing together many structures in different states of the protein, we also can learn something about the dynamics. In this case, we are showing you our best understanding of what we think happens at the instant that HIV contacts a T cell, and we show some of the remarkable changes uh, that we've deduced must occur on the surface of these envelope glycoproteins when it makes contact with the receptors in the cell. Uh, this approach of determining structures by averaging the proteins present in intact viruses has also been extended to looking at intact cells in our work with E. coli we've actually determined the structures of membrane proteins while they're still present in the context of an intact cell. And in a series of papers, we've actually shown that we can determine not just the structures, single structures of these membrane proteins, but also learn something about the equilibrium between two distinct conformations of the proteins, and also something about what it takes to convert, the, convert them from one state to the other. Uh, we show in the case of the chemotaxis receptor that we can drive it from close to open conformations by ligand binding, and also, more recently, have shown that this type of information can be used to compute some of the physiological responses of the cell, uh, starting all the way from tomography and testing it uh, using physiological assays. So these are examples where we're using tomography uh, and subvolume averaging to learn something about the structure and also something about the way these proteins behave when they're present in the native, uh, native cells. Uh, it's not just uh, protein information that we get from the tomography. We also learn a lot about the overall architecture of these cells. And here are a couple of examples where we have used cryo-electron tomography to learn about the, the mechanisms by which uh, flavor bacteria uh, carry out their gliding motion, shown on the left side, and the right side, a unique glimpse of the 3D organization of the bacterial nucleoid. The examples I've given you so far, uh, viruses, bacteria, small protein complexes, are typically thin enough that they can be imaged using a transmission electron microscope. But when we think about larger objects, mammalian cells, tissues, they're far too thick to be imaged in the transmission mode. And to obtain structures of these larger entities, we've been using a technology that we call ion abrasion scanning electron microscopy, also called focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy by others. And essentially the idea here is to use the scanning electron microscope to image the surface of microscopic objects but combine this with using a focused ion beam, typically made of gallium, to, ab uh, to essentially abrade away a small region of the surface, uh, thicknesses ranging all the way from 10 nanometers down to much more, maybe several tens of nanometers. But the idea is that by iterating, imaging using the scanning electron beam and the use of the focused ion beam, we can walk our way into the specimen. Uh, an example of this is shown in the next slide, where we are now literally walking into a melanoma cell by taking away about 20 to 30 nanometers at a time. And by combining these images <clears throat> as we walk into the cell, we can then stitch them together to uh, make a 3D representation shown on the right-hand side of the interior of this melanoma cell. And images like this actually begin to teach us a lot about how the various subcellular organelles are arranged within the cell, uh, something about the relative, relative arrangement of different subcellular organelles and how they might actually be, uh, in turn, important in determining the state of the cell. Uh, 
one of the uh, sort of advances uh, that, it, that has been very important in our work is the improvements in speed and resolution of this imaging. And looking back uh, to a few years ago when you know, we, we did our first reconstructions of yeast cells with Z resolutions of maybe 100 to 150 nanometers, with, you know, taking many, many days, uh, sometimes weeks to get a single 3D, a 3D map. We are now at a point where uh, we can actually image an entire mammalian cell in a few hours. And this type of speed uh, is likely to be important in both the statistical sense and also uh, learning more about the uh, nature of variation among different cell populations. Uh, <clears throat> some examples of where this type of technology has been uh, really useful in providing unexpected insights is in our work with the surface of antigen presenting cells, where in looking at cells such as dendritic cells and macrophages, we've learned that the surface of these cells uh, actually is uh, uh, is composed of an extraordinary uh, set of membrane, uh, membrane invaginations which appear to be important in the function of these cells. Uh, shown here is a representation of dendritic cells and in the next slide you see that uh, macrophages which are also antigen presenting cells have these type of extraordinary uh, surface invaginations which we think uh, are important in capturing HIV particles shown there in red and uh, also give you, an give you some insight into how a 3D image of these cells is much more uh, informative and actually gives you a more accurate representation than 2D slices, which might give you a misleading representation of the organization of these cells. Uh, one of the limitations of these approaches for imaging whole cells, actually in general electron microscopy, is that we are looking at fixed cells or frozen cells and have lost the dynamic information. And in an effort to try to get some of this back, we have now been, de we have developed recently methods to carry out correlative uh, live confocal imaging with ion abrasion SEM imaging with the idea of uh, trying to carry out imaging of localized regions that we identify using a uh, fluorescence microscope. In this example, you see on the left hand side a, a slice through a confocal image of, uh, of an HIV particle shown in green in contact with a T cell whose outline you can see in red. And if you look at the image of the same cell, which we've now done using ion abrasion scanning EM, which, is now, which now captures not just the fluorescent entities, but the entire ultrastructure of the cell, we can now combine these two uh, and essentially match up the location of the virus uh, with, uh, with the ion abrasion SEM image. But of course, we get a lot more, which is the structure of the entire, uh, the entire cell in terms of the uh, uh, various subcellular organelles. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, I'd like to tell you, uh, at least introduce to you some of the, the ways we are thinking about uh, taking this technology forward uh, to add a further dimension by carrying out chemical imaging uh, in order to actually not just describe the, the, the shape of the organelles or the shapes of the membranes, but to also learn about the chemical, uh, or, uh, chemical uh, gradients that might be present within the cell. And using secondary, uh, secondary ion mass spectrometry and a method called atom probe tomography, we're taking some beginning steps towards mapping the chemical gradients present within uh, mammalian cells uh, that have been actually freeze dried, but uh, without, any, without any stains or fixatives. So these are several examples of the ways that we, are, we have been developing and applying methods for 3D imaging. And one of the important themes that uh, really has changed the landscape of this entire uh, process of imaging is that we've gone from more conventional methods involving you know, scientists sitting at a microscope collecting images uh, using, using instruments for microscopy to a situation where we now have tools for biological discovery where we have much greater automation, where we can look at much higher throughput and essentially in many respects have reduced the operations of a microscope to essentially a data collecting machine. And in this case, we illustrate this with work in our lab on HIV imaging where we now have many of the procedures in place for automated determination of structures of envelope glycoproteins. Uh, in summary then, I've uh, given examples of imaging uh, things from, from the small scale to the large scale. And uh, essentially uh, what I'd like to highlight is that these methods in 3D electron microscopy offer great promise for imaging assemblies small and large. And in particular, they go beyond merely describing structure to many instances providing unexpected information on biological mechanisms. Uh, there's more information on the work we do in our lab at our website whose address is at the bottom and to many of the people who have really contributed to the success of this work. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Subramaniam. I do like that photograph of Barack Obama <laughs> at the electron microscope.